the Second World War is the biggest conflict that man has ever entered into. And there's not one part of the world where its effects were not felt. 80 years on since it started, and the traces of it in the UK are slowly being eroded away. The men and women that fought in it and survived are passing on. But you don't have to look too hard to still see its imprint on the landscape. Here in Dorset and Hampshire there were seven airfields and a collection of associated radar stations and communication hubs. RAF Christchurch, Warmwell, Rushton, Hearn, Stony Cross, Holmesley and Ibsley. All operational and flying a variety of different types of combat and supply aircraft. From Spitfires and Lancaster bombers to American P-38 Lightnings Avro Yorks, gliders, and even flying boats coming out of pool. These airfields played a major part in not only defending Britain from the Luftwaffe, but taking supplies to all the major theatres of war across the world. The bombing campaigns against Germany, the defence of convoys and shipping, and of course in Operation Overlord, the D-Day landings and the invasion of mainland Europe in June 1944. You join me here today at Tarrant Rushton, situated a mile from the historical site of Badbury Rings. Now at first glance it just looks like some farmer's fields with a large barn in it, but back in World War II this place was central to three of the most important operations. All that remains now is this hangar, another hangar down there, and various bits of concrete. A lot of the airfields were constructed in response to the outbreak of war in 1939. Tarrant Rushton wasn't established until 1943. Work began in September of 1942, finally finished in May of 1943. The RAF ground crews arrived and then they were shortly followed by the RAF defence team. Their job was the security of the airfield, but most importantly, the defence against the Luftwaffe with anti-aircraft cover. The first planes to arrive were Lockheed Vega Venturers, and these would be used by Coastal Command. A day later, a prototype, Albemarle, arrived to take part in glider trials as a tow plane. The world's first real glider was built in 1853, by British engineer George Cayley, and its maiden flight carried Cayley and his terrified servant across a small valley before crash landing. However, it was the Germans who were the first to use gliders in warfare, most famously during the assault of the Eben Emel fortress in Belgium, and in the capture of the bridges over the Elbe Canal. This was on May the 10th, 1940, an operation in which 41 DFS-230 gliders carrying 10 soldiers each were launched behind Junkers Ju-52 tow planes. The British realised from the very successful attack on Belgium that gliders could be an important part of their arsenal. So in 1941, Winston Churchill appointed George Chatterton, a very charismatic leader and a very strict disciplinarian to bring gliders into the war. His background, he was a RAF pilot pre-war and also was an infantry officer. This put him in good stead to bring highly trained British soldiers and make them into skillful glider pilots. Their motto was, nothing is impossible. Each airfield had its own dedicated aircraft and operations, such as Fighter Command, Bomber Command, Transportation and Supply, Coastal Defence, Naval Command. Tarrant Rushton was no exception. It was a dedicated glider airfield. Its primary function, the delivery of men and equipment to the front line. 
it also supplied the SOE and the French resistance in occupied territories. The importance of Tarrant Rustian during World War II cannot be underestimated. We're here at the Army Museum at Middle Wallop to find out a little bit more about World War II gliders. Britain started the war with no salt gliders. All it could use were the sports gliders it had commandeered from the uh, gliding clubs such as the Kirby Kite we have behind me. We were building uh, the salt glider which was the eight-seat General Aircraft Limited Hotspur. Um, it soon became apparent that uh, even eight seats were not large enough. They wanted something bigger, so we designed and built a 25 seat Horsa glider. The Americans, they built the Waco CG4A, which would carry about 15, 15 troops behind me. And uh, that was, became the most numerously built glider in the Second World War. The final glider was the tank carrying General Aircraft Limited Hamilcar living behind me. We're in the Hamilcar at the moment and that's the tank carrying glider. Uh, you could get a, uh, a seven ton, eight ton tank in it, the Vickers Tetrarch or the American M22. You could also get two Lloyd carriers in here, Bren Gun carriers. But the better load was the Morris Quad and the 17 pounder anti-tank gun. The Horsa glider could carry a Jeep with a gun and uh, a trailer full of equipment. They were constructed mostly of wood and uh, not very good quality wood at that. They were built by f mostly furniture manufacturers or f uh, firms that would produce things like railway carriages. This is a Horsa glider on display here at the Army Flying Museum at Middle Wallet. It's a, one of the original gliders that was used in Operation Varsity in crossing the Rhine in March 1945. The men would be packed into the glider along with their heavy equipment. Then they would be towed off the airfield by a four engine Halifax aircraft attached by a small thin rope. They would reach a ceiling of around 6,000 feet cruising at 150 miles an hour. It would have been cold and drafty. When they reached the target area, they would be released, gliding down at 100 miles an hour in the dark, hopefully landing on a flat field with no obstacles. There was no protection from gunfire and certainly no protection from a crash landing. This is a Hamilcar glider. The pilots belong to the army. Their job just didn't finish after landing. Not only did they have to fly these gliders in with the utmost precision and skill, after landing they had to be equally at home manning a Bren gun, driving a jeep, firing a rifle, an anti-tank weapon or a mortar. These gliders were vulnerable to say the least, but the men boarded them under orders without question showing unbelievable bravery and commitment. A quality rarely required in today's health and safety centric world. Many pilots and soldiers died or sustained terrible injuries on landing. All that held the equipment or vehicles in place were metal pins and rope straps fixed onto a reinforced wooden floor. If it was not flat where they landed, and they hit ditches, bumps, tree stumps, banks, or even a tractor. The fuselage would be ripped like paper, equipment would be torn from its fixings and be flung around the glider causing devastating injuries and many fatalities. On the eve of D-Day, June the 6th, 
1944, at approximately 2300 hours, 181 assault troops of D Company of the 2nd Battalion of the Oxford and Bucks Regiment left from here at Tarrant Rushton. They were part of Operation Deadstick. Their primary objective was the taking of the bridges over the Khan Canal and the Orme River. We commonly know it as Pegasus Bridge. They landed within spitting distance of the bridges and they took them within 15 minutes. Unfortunately, not all operations were so straightforward. On the 17th of September 1944, an operation took place to insert airborne troops ahead of the main body of the army to secure the bridges over the waterways from Eidenhoven to Arnhem, making it possible for the Allied forces to cross the Rhine. This operation was codenamed Market Garden and was the subject of a classic film, A Bridge Too Far. The mission failed at Arnhem. The gliders were loaded with lightly armoured paratroops. They landed too far away from the objective. They also landed on top of two SS crack panzer divisions on respite from the Russian front. The military leaders knew about this, but failed to postpone the operation at horrendous cost to the 1st, 2nd and 11th parachute regiment. Out of the 34,000 men that took part, 17,500 men were killed or injured, including 500 glider pilots. Operation Varsity was the largest ever airborne operation to take place on a single day in one location, involving over 16,000 paratroops and 2,000 aircraft. Its purpose was to secure a foothold across the Rhine River by landing two divisions on the eastern bank. In this operation, over 4,000 Allied troops were reported killed, injured or missing in action, and over 56 aircraft were lost. Many of them flew from here, Tarrant Rushton. This was the last place they saw of their home country, and they never returned. On a beautiful, bright, sunny day like today, when a cloud crosses the sun and blots it out, one can't help but reflect the sadness of it all. The war in Europe ended September the 2nd, 1945. But this wasn't the end of Tarrant Rushton. With me today, I have Pete Scribben, who's a local World War II historian. Pete, tell me, what happened to the airfield after the end of the war in Europe? After the Second World War, everything went quiet here, actually, once the gliders had left, once the two squadrons had gone and gone to the, off to India or wherever. Um, then it was very quiet and the aircraft was put into care and maintenance in September. It's, it was in care and maintenance till December 1947 when Sir Alan Cobham got interested in it. He was looking for somewhere to relocate. This was the ideal environment. The airfield's, the, the runway's a mile long. It's got a drop off at this end. It was perfect for their requirements. It's interesting to just know how, how much this, air, you know, how important this airfield was and still is probably to aviation. What happened to the gliders after World War II? Some of them were scrapped, some of them were, were used for um, caravans, some of them were used for chicken huts, somebody lived in one for a number of years. Some of them were actually sold to, their, to the Indian, Indian Air Force and the Canadians had some as well. They were looking at using them. Some of them actually did go to the Far East. So after Germany was spliced in half by the Russians, what happened here from Tarrant Rushton? 
well, Cobham got involved in the Berlin airlift. Alan Cobham was primarily involved. He was one of the two main British companies that got involved. He was the, his aircraft, his Lancaster or Lancastrian, was the first aircraft to actually take fuel to Berlin. They operated a nine aircraft out of here. They maintained the aircraft here. Then they'd go off to Germany and deliver the fuel to Germany. They did that for that nearly a whole year. He, he um, increased the number of people working here from 200 to nearly 600. So in the end, the, um, the operation finished when Cobham then had to look for alternate work for his workforce. He, you know, he'd employed all these extra people, including crew that were coming over here to be trained. The tr crews were trained at, uh, at Tarrant Rushton. He was looking for alternate work. He couldn't, he, had to, he got rid of certain, quite a number of, of, of his staff, which he didn't want to do. So Pete, during the Cold War um, with, with, with Russia, what was happening here? This was used as a, a V bomber dispersal. So they would sit on the end of the runway, fully loaded, ready to go. So we could have had live nuclear weapons we could have here had live nuclear where we're, weapons. we're standing. Yeah, exactly, yes. And finally, the demise of the airfield and its final flight out. The last aircraft to leave Tarrant Rushton was a Sea Vixen. It flew out of here on the 3rd, the 3rd of September 1980, having Cobham having been here for over 40 years. Once it left, it, it uh, banked round because it was on its way, so it would have gone to Bournemouth, because that would where it was relocated. And as it turned to go to Bournemouth, the pilot looked out and saw that they were demolishing the control tower. So that obviously was the end of the airfield as we knew it. The card core that they, that they dug up was taken to put into Wimborne Bypass, which was constructed in just after 1980. Tarrant Rushton was only operational for 37 years, but during that period of time, it was part of some of the most important historical moments. From glider landings in World War II, through to the Berlin Airlift, and tactical training operations with the V-bombers during the Cold War. It was fundamental in the design of two of the world's most iconic aircraft, the Harrier and Concorde. So if you find yourself walking across the Dorset countryside near Tarrant Rushton, have a look for some of those tell-tale signs, those few clues that remain, that tell the story of times gone by, a hidden gem in the Dorset landscape.